from Toby Rice and Clay Carroll that natural gas is a game changer for our state. To continue that growth, the governor announced, you heard him this morning, and has put together an all-star team consisting of Austin Caperton, Chelsea Ruby, and Dave Hardy. Uh, Chelsea is unable to be with us today. Austin Caperton was appointed to be the Secretary of the West Virginia Department of Environmental Protection in January 2017. He's a graduate of Virginia Tech and of WVU College of Law. Secretary Caperton has extensive experience with providing strategic direction, acquisition, disposition, financing, and project-oriented services in the energy-related fields. Dave Hardy has served as Secretary for the West Virginia Department of Revenue since January of 2017. He has more than 33 years of experience in private legal practice and is a certified public accountant. Prior to his role as Cabinet Secretary, Dave served six years on the Charleston City Council and for 16 years as a Kanawha County Commissioner. Please welcome Austin and Dave to the stage. Are we on? Thank you. Are we up? Thank you. <clears throat> Dave's late. He's already started working on the project. <laughs> <clears throat> Ladies and gentlemen, I usually speak from the hip, but there's too much to say today. This is what a revolution looks like, this graph right here. It's going to be available online as well the whole presentation, so you don't have to take notes. You can actually pay attention. Print it. Put it in your files. You're going to want to show it to your grandchildren someday and say, this is the future of West Virginia, and it began a transformation. So you can see the natural gas industry plugged along from 67 till about 2011 at about 200,000 MCF a year. Is that right, 200,000 MCF, you guess? Okay. Um, and then all of a sudden we shoot, and we go from, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to change it to billions. We go from an average of a couple of hundred billion cubic feet a year to 1.8 trillion. That's trillion with a T. A 600% increase in our gas production in that short period. <clears throat> that explosion in production has been a tremendous economic driver for the state of West Virginia. Anybody who lives in the northern part of the state knows what's happened up there. It's absolutely amazing. The investment, the jobs created, the economy, it's, it's absolutely amazing. But it's only the beginning. Harnessing this resource is Governor Justice's paramount goal in the next part of his tenure as governor. Today, we're announcing a major step in accomplishing it. We have an opportunity to transform the state, and we are going to try to take advantage of it, and we're going to succeed. Next. We, have, we went from 4.9 trillion cubic feet of reserves to 35.9 million in 10 years. And that just keeps going up. I know something about reserves in the resource business. That's the reserves right there, the 35.9 that we have proven today. Below that, there's another level they'll call probable, and it'll be significantly more than that. And as the industry advances and moves out into other gas fields and taps the current gas fields further, that reserve, that reserve number will go up. It'll continue to go up. Then there's a third level called resource. We didn't even talk about that because Wall Street doesn't pay any attention to it. <clears throat> POTUS believes in us. And here in the Appalachian region, where the Marcellus and Utica shale formations generate one-third of American natural gas. Think of that. You've been sitting on this for a long time, and yet look at the numbers. Look at the way you lived, because you never had anybody that wanted to take advantage of it. But now we're taking advantage of it. You're sitting on gold and we're taking advantage of it. And your future has never looked brighter or better. It's so great that you stayed, because you suffered 
this whole region, Appalachia, the whole region, it just suffered, this whole region, with great people, the greatest people. By the way, Chelsea Ruby is with us today. She's up there in the control tower making all this happen. Thank you, Chelsea. The president is exactly right. We're sitting on a gold mine, trillions of barrels of ethane. Ethane feeds the petrochemical industry. That industry drives our modern economy. Today, we produce about 260,000 barrels a day of ethane. By 2025, just seven years from now, six years from now, sorry for my math, 640,000 barrels per day are projected. We could support, that president's speech was made from the cracker under construction just across the river in Monaco, PA. Estimates are that our region could support five crackers. They make ethylene out of ethane. Shell is building this one. Another one is likely to be announced soon. West Virginia is going to benefit from all them. Pennsylvania put $1.5 billion into theirs. Sorry, is that going to be in yours? I'm sorry. And we're going to benefit from their investment. Ethylene is going to fuel and feed extensive downstream manufacturing facilities, not to mention pipelines, storage hubs, all driving unbelievable economic activity. We must capture our share. We don't want ladies selling their life belongings on the road. It says here I'm supposed to pause until there's an applause. We don't want ladies <laughs> selling their life belongings on the road. <clears throat> We're working very closely with the U.S. Department of Energy. We have with us today Ken. Ken. I had a senior moment, Ken. Humphreys. Ken Humphreys. Please stand up, Ken, so they can see you. Um, he is one of the top officials. Now we got the message here. He's one of the top officials of the US DOE. He's been to see us many times. Um, the Department of Energy is fully behind what we are doing. He will be around later to answer questions. And I don't know how long you're going to be here, Ken. As long as you need him to be here, he will be here today. <clears throat> Why is this so important to the White House? because it's a significant part of the U.S. economy. 25% of the U.S. GDP, petrochemical industry, 12% of the world's chemicals, and 529,000 American jobs. And the security of the United States is at stake. Hurricanes in the Gulf, any kind of strange attack in the Gulf, and the U.S. industry struggles and suffers. The price of gas can usually be traced when it escalates rapidly to hurricanes in the Gulf of Mexico. We have solved that problem, and we have made gas a reliable, steadily priced commodity. I'm sure in the gas industry think it's priced too lowly, but that's a fact. <clears throat> what is the Appalachian petrochemical renaissance? We have 32% of the U.S. natural gas and 600,000 barrels per day of natural gas liquids produced. That's natural gas liquids. We've seen an incredible production boom here in West Virginia. The U.S. used to be an expensive place in the world to produce ethylene. It is now one of the cheapest thanks to our resources. Soon, hundreds of billions of dollars of products will be made here. Some will make a fortune. Who's going to make the fortune and where is it going to be made? West Virginia is perfectly situated for several reasons, but first and foremost, it all comes down to the resource. Most of the drilling that produces natural gas liquids, or NGLs, ethane, propane, and butane, the feedstocks that produce plastic, most of that is happening in this state. And our production numbers are through the roof. And Taro is the second largest producer of natural gas liquids in the nation. And all of our rigs this morning are right here in West Virginia. How do we harness this resource? We work hard and smart. As the governor says, we are not going to confuse effort, confuse effort with accomplishment. We must succeed, and we will succeed. Page four. <clears throat> You're looking here at the value chain of the natural gas process. You start with the natural gas. You treat the gas. You process the gas. You separate the natural gas liquids. 
and then you send them off to crackers, to propane, but they call them PhD crackers, I believe, for the propane and butane side of the equation. Here's where we're going to be focused right here in the short term. We already got a cracker going in, and the downstream activities are going to be here. We want a cracker. They take a long time and cost $10 billion a piece. These plants seem small, might seem small, but they can be billions of dollars of investments as well. And those are going to need to be here to take the stuff from the cracker. 80% of all products manufactured today are made from petrochemicals. <clears throat> Excuse me. A cracker comes first. Then come the plants making polyethylene. Each and every one of these plants can have a huge economic impact. By the way, oh, there's another step. Polyethylene and then plastics and other chemicals. Each and every one can have a huge, huge economic impact. impact. Phones, clothing, bedding, food casing, credit cards, bags, soaps and detergents, antifreeze, IV and blood bags, adhesives, appliances, batteries, insulation, paint, furniture, rubber, fiber. You name it, everything you're wearing has some polyethylene in it. Every single thing in this room has polyethylene in it. It's amazing what's going on in this world. Our goal is to capture these downstream manufacturing and jobs. We want to turn West Virginia gas into West Virginia product. We are ideally positioned to capitalize on this opportunity. The window is now, and we have to seize the opportunity. So we have all this resource coming from the West Virginia Rock, and that supply makes it cheaper here in all scenarios than it is in the Gulf Coast. A facility which locates here would have a big cost advantage when it comes to feedstock price and feedstock transportation. So you have the supply, you have the low cost, and importantly here in West Virginia, you have a fair and predictable regulatory environment. Whether it's a storage field or a crack or anything else, it's going to take a pipeline to get into the facilities. Ethane cannot be shipped by rail or truck, and so a pipeline is necessary. And we've seen, particularly in other states, how regulatory approval can be a moving target. Not here in West Virginia. A shout out to Antero for the investment they've made in West Virginia and for their cooperation with me. Um, I said, I, I knew about this job two weeks ago, by the way, and I said to Al, I need to get Primer, and he arranged for himself and two of the top executives from Denver to get on a, con a teleconference call with me and several people in the DEP and others. And we were able to learn so much, or I was able to learn so much in that three-hour teleconference call about the industry, what's going on, so forth and so on. Thank you, Al. I don't know if you're here or not, but I appreciate the effort that you put into that. <clears throat> we have the location. It has started with the shell cracker. It started with our production. It has started again with the shell cracker. We can make it happen. We can make it happen. <clears throat> we have an absolutely incredible workforce. And I know this from experience. In the early 50s, the mines mechanized, and a, I think 100,000 coal miners lost their jobs. Guess what they did? They went out and they populated all the factories in Central America and the Northeast. They made America great first. West Virginia workers, same thing, teachers. In the mid-70s, when the state was putting out teachers left and right, a lot of them went to Florida. And the first question they asked when they went to the factory or they went to, went to the school board to get a job, they said, where are you from? We're from West Virginia, you're hired. West Virginians have an amazing work ethic. I've seen it everywhere. I've never seen a workforce any more competent than the workforce I had at Slab 4 Coal Company. They chased people off who wouldn't work hard. They did. We didn't have to. And I've seen it at the DEP. I've seen it all over the state of West Virginia. I used to ask the question, who thinks West Virginia has a workforce problem? And everybody would raise their hand. And then I'd ask the question, well, all you business people out there who have lousy workforces raise their hand. And nobody did. We have a fabulous workforce. Our labor rates are below the national average. We have the second lowest turnover rate in the Mid-Atlantic region and the lowest injury rate in the region. Global leaders have found success in West Virginia. We have a strong business climate. Procter & Gamble, Toyota, Hino, just to name a few. 
The Tax Foundation in 2019 said that we were the regional leader with the most friendly tax policies of all of the surrounding states. Regional leader, most friendly tax policies, all the surrounding states. We just don't hear that very often, but that's what the Tax Foundation says about us. We have new opportunities thanks to the President. He recognizes the, transfer, no, the transformative potential for Appalachia, devoting significant resources to the effort, helping West Virginia seize our opportunity. And you already heard the governor talk about his relationship with the president, and it's already borne fruit in terms of the regulatory environment of the U.S. government and policies, and it's going to start to bear fruit in this effort. Is we already have industries in West Virginia that could benefit from the proximity of these kinds of inputs for production. And you have the automotive industry where you have companies like Toyota. You have the aerospace industry where you have companies like Aurora who is tied to Boeing. And then you have industries in manufacturing like Procter & Gamble. So we already have part of our demand for these products in West Virginia. It's trying to create the supply chain for them. We are ideal for petrochemical manufacturing. We're close to the marketing, the manufacturing markets in the East Coast and the Midwest. The industry will attract its estimated $36 billion in investment, 101,000 new steady jobs, 28 billion in economic expansion, and almost $3 billion in tax revenues annually. That's amazing. We want our piece of that pie, and we're going to go after it hard. Let's make sure West Virginia resources create West Virginia jobs. How are we going to get started on this? Listen to John Deskins, who's here. John, where are you? I know he's here. Oh, he probably had important business to do. <clears throat> the director of WVU's Bureau of Business and Economic Research. We We have this great opportunity, but we shouldn't assume that it's just going to happen. Because we have these advantages doesn't necessarily mean it's going to happen because the competitive environment out there is fierce. Texas and Louisiana are vying for these jobs, as are Ohio and, uh, Ohio and Pennsylvania. So we still need to have a sense of urgency. We need to be very aggressive in doing what we need to do to, to attract these businesses to West Virginia. Uh, we need to do a full review of our policy environment in West Virginia to make sure that our public policies or our economic policies are attractive to these businesses. We need to make sure that our infrastructure is attractive to these businesses. We have to make sure that these businesses can find sites that are available. Uh, and we have to make sure that we can provide the skilled, healthy, educated, drug-free workers that these businesses demand if they were to locate in West Virginia. So the opportunity's there, but we can't just assume it will happen. We gotta be diligent to make these businesses attracted to our state instead of our competitors. So why now? United States security. We have the resource developed. We have the support of the administration. Ken's not gonna tell you this, but the administration wants jobs in West Virginia. Just West Virginia, that's all they want. <clears throat> other members of the task force, that, uh, other than uh, Secretary Hardy and I and Chelsea Ruby, Javier Reyes, 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 West Virginia Business School Dean, there's a lot longer title. Javier, are you in the room? All the West Virginia guys must be where He's back there in the back. back. Thank you, Javier. Uh, Jim Wood, the director of the West Virginia Ener Energy Research Center, and uh, we all have each other's cell phones, and we've all been talking and coordinating and figuring, um, and I'm really pleased to serve with all of these folks. Um, next slide, the Downstream Jobs Task Force. Why is it going to succeed? Well, one of the reasons is we're going to make sure we're competitive, and I don't get to talk about that. You've got the expert, the secretary of the Department of Tax and Revenue to tell you all about that. Dave Hardy. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Austin. Thank you very much. It's wonderful to be here today. I was thrilled, and I mean that, when the governor asked me to participate on this task force. I felt honored to be able to sit down with uh, Dr. Reyes, or the gentleman, Ken Humphreys from the Department of Energy, Jim Wood from WVU, and in one hour, one hour I understood my charge. The governor told me he wanted my, me personally, as a member of the task force, to try to understand in depth what all the other states and our competitors are doing. 
when you saw Dr. Deskins up there on the screen a few minutes ago, the word that stuck in my mind, two words, fierce competition. Fierce competition. Why wouldn't there be competition for a facility, a cracker, that costs $10 billion to build, that would generate 5,000 construction jobs, and that's a conservative estimate, Five to 600 permanent jobs. Sure, there's going to be competition. But West Virginia, with our governor leading the way, wants us to step forward and compete. And let me give you some data that I learned, that we learned collectively from our friends at the Department of Energy. I'll, I'll throw some facts at you here because I'm a numbers person. I like numbers, okay? Here's some numbers. Uh, research shows that there's enough production in Appalachia right now to justify the construction of, of five crackers. Five crackers. Let me tell you, right now, to my knowledge, there's one being built in Beaver County, Pennsylvania, which I'm going to talk about in detail. And Ohio is putting forth, across the river from Moundsville, West Virginia, in Belmont County, Ohio is putting forth a site for a cracker. So Pennsylvania's out there. Their, their cracker proposal was accepted. I'll go into detail here in a minute on what Pennsylvania did to pull that off. Ohio has their site, and they are in negotiations with a company called PTT, which is a Thai company, on whether or not there will be a cracker built on the Ohio side of the river there across the river from Moundsville. Now, one thing we should all remember, a cracker built any place in our region still generates economic activity potentially for West Virginia. I saw a survey last night on Yahoo Finance. I don't know if anybody else saw this story. It was about super commuters. And super commuters are defined as uh, workers that drive more than 90 minutes one way to get to work. Guess, guess which industry in the United States has the most super computers? The extraction industry. And it even highlighted in this national article that Huntington, Ashland, Ironton area has the most supercomputers of any place in the whole United States. So there's no question when you have the construction of a cracker, say, in Beaver County, PA, Belmont County, Ohio, that economic downstream activity spreads everywhere. But we still want to try and propose and compete for a cracker to be built in West Virginia. 20% of the production from the Appalachia area will be used by the new Shell facility in Beaver County, Pennsylvania. That means, and again, this is according to our friends at the Department of Energy, that means 80% of the production from the Appalachia uh, area is now going to be headed to the Gulf Coast. 80% going south, 20% staying in Beaver County. There's a 23% cost advantage to build a cracker and to, put, to uh, use 23% less expense to have a cracker product from West Virginia or Ohio or Pennsylvania versus the Gulf Coast. So these are numbers generated by the Department of Energy and we will use them very effectively. Um, I was asked about the situation I mentioned there a minute ago, it takes 5,000 jobs to build a cracker, minimum, five to 600 permanent jobs. We are now sending 130,000 barrels per day of ethane is being shipped from Appalachia south to the Gulf Coast area. This is enough alone to justify the immediate construction of one and a half more crackers right now. 70% of the U.S. market for the product the product that Austin talked about there a few minutes ago is within eight hours of Pittsburgh. And a cracker site needs to be on the Ohio River, Parkersburg North. And I was under the naive assumption, and this is, I'm going to show my own ignorance here, that you needed the water from the Ohio River. I was wrong. According to the Department of Energy folks, you need the Ohio River to transport by barge all of the materials and parts and pieces of these cracker plants that come up the river. They're manufactured and they're shipped up the river. 
you have to have a hundred foot clearance from the bridges to even be in the game to transport what you need to build a cracker up the river. Unfortunately, that eliminates the Canal River because most of the bridges of the Canal River do not have a hundred foot clearance. Uh, there are only about a dozen companies in the whole world that could even potentially build a cracker and several have indicated that they want to stay at the Gulf Coast. So our focus is laser. It's not like it's thousand companies out there that you have to talk to. You've got to focus in and identify a very limited number of companies, probably count them on less than two hands, that are potentially going to build a cracker in West Virginia along the Ohio River. Uh, let, me tell how, let me tell you a little bit about the competition. Ohio. Ohio did something a couple years ago, uh, three or four years ago, that I had read about, but I, I, I learned more detail about it as we were starting to work on this project. Ohio privatized economic development. They have an organization called Jobs Ohio, and they sold their liquor license, their liquor revenue for the next 25 years. So they are funding Jobs Ohio through the sale of their liquor revenue over the next 25 years. The site that Ohio is holding out as a potential cracker site is the one I mentioned across the river from Moundsville. They immediately pledged, I get my number right here, $17 million in cash to help clean up the site, and they have pledged $30 million in site preparation work to enhance the site. So as we stand here today, they don't have a deal done with this Thai company, but they have ponied up to the table with a $47 million cash offer. And you say, well, that's a tremendous commitment. But let me contrast that for you on what Pennsylvania did. Pennsylvania has, of course, in Beaver County, they have a uh, cracker being constructed today. And many of our state commerce officials, I know Secretary Gaunch, Development Director Graney, they've been up there and looked at the site. And everybody that's been up there is just blown away by how large it is and how complex the construction site is. But here's what Pennsylvania did by way of inducement. They offered a $10 million cash grant for preparation of the site. They then offered, and it was accepted by Shell, a 15-year tax amnesty on corporate net income tax and payroll tax. So those things were immediate. The $10 million cash grant, the 15-year amnesty. Then Pennsylvania did something that I thought was pretty intelligent on their part, on its part. They said if the plant gets into production, it has to get in production, then they will offer a $2.10 per barrel tax credit for ethane produced in the state of Pennsylvania. Now think about that for a minute. If, if the cracker plant purchases ethane from drillers inside the state of Pennsylvania, there's a tax credit for $2.10 per barrel, which is about five cents per gallon. That program starts immediately upon production and there's no production from the plant yet. I don't think the plant's gonna be completed for several years. But the window to take that tax credit is 2017 to 2042. So they created a 25 year tax credit window, but it's only for ethane purchased from Pennsylvania natural driller company. So I don't know, Constitutionally, that, there may be an issue there. I don't know. I, I look across the room and see all these lawyers out here. I used to be a lawyer, but after 33 years, I gave it up. And I think that it's interesting that Pennsylvania tied their credit to gas ethane produced in Pennsylvania. I thought that was very interesting on their part. Uh, the credit can be sold up to 50%. It can be sold immediately after one year so these tax credits, after one year of the plant being in production, can then be sold. So we projected 
along with a lot of other experts, and that's why I'm so glad we have WVU helping us, and, and they will be helping us trying to measure all these measurables. We project that that tax credit potentially is worth $1.65 billion over 25 years. So Pennsylvania came to the table all in. $10 million plus the 15-year economic development zone credit plus the incentive credit of the credit against $2.10 a barrel. So you can see what Pennsylvania did. They put some money up front, but then they intelligently tied all their tax credits to production from the plant in the future. So this is the fierce competition that we're with. Now, where I am going to rely on WVU, and I'm so glad Dr. Reyes is in our, our, on our task force, I'm going to have WVU help me and help our task force understand what the real economic impact is the moment these crackers go operation. You can immediately figure out that construction is a huge economic impact, but that's a window of time. But what is the economic impact once they go operational? And then, of course, the downstream industries that Austin has focused a lot of energy and time on trying to determine where those will take us. Because you don't have to be in the same state to have a downstream industry from a cracker. I mean, Beaver County, Pennsylvania is adjacent to Hancock County, West Virginia. Belmont County of Ohio is across the river from West Virginia. So there's a potential even from those crackers for West Virginia to capitalize on a lot of downstream economic activity as well. This is exciting stuff. But as Dr. Deskin said, it's a fierce competition. And, and, and we are charged by the governor with the help of our legislature and with the help of WVU to make West Virginia compete here. And I think we will. And I'm really looking forward to working on this task force. Uh, and I'm going to turn it back over to Austin. But uh, again, thanks for hearing us out on this. It's a, it's a complex subject, but it's a very exciting subject. So thank you very much. And uh, I'll be glad to answer any questions here in a few minutes. Thank you very much. Great job. Thank you. Thank you. Take a quick look. But our president and our secretary of energy and Stephen and, the, and all those are all in in this natural gas hub, the petrochemical stuff coming to West Virginia, coming to the, this area of our, of our country, all the different things that are right at our fingertips. Investments that could bring more than 100,000 new jobs to this region are now being looked at very seriously. And I think the $100,000, I really do, I feel the 100,000 jobs, Andrew, is going to be a very low number. I think you're going to have many more. This is an incredible region. You're sitting on top of something special. It's all fueled by the greatest treasure on the planet. American energy, and we don't want people taking that away from us. So uh, I pledge that I'm going to work as hard as I possibly can. Uh, we have a fabulous team. We all get along in spite of the fact that the tax department has denied my 2018 refund. But <laughs> we're going to sort through that. I want to thank you all for listening to us. Uh, I'm a huge fan of the governor of the state of West Virginia. And I'm honored that he chose me and the team to represent us. All of us will be around in the back and so forth and be glad to talk to anybody about what we've got going on. And we welcome any help that's offered. Thank you very much.